Hey, I'm Dan Harris. I am a fidgety, skeptical newsman who had a panic attack live on Good Morning America. To prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. That led me to something I always thought was ridiculous, meditation. I wrote a book about it, launched an app, and now I'm starting this podcast to try to figure out if there's anything beyond 10%. Basically, here's what I'm obsessed with. Can you be an ambitious person who is nonetheless striving for enlightenment, whatever that means? Let's start the show. My guest this time is one of the most interesting dudes I've ever met. Check out his resume. He is a lawyer, a rabbi, a meditation teacher, a gay rights activist, an author, and a columnist for the Daily Beast. He's Jay Michelson. Did I miss anything? That's more than enough. Really? But you also... You skipped the professor at theological seminary, but that's fine. Yeah. It's, 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 it's an impressive list. Now, primarily my interest in, in you is that you are... Well, a couple things. One is that you're, uh, you've done a lot of meditation, serious meditation, months of silent retreat, and yet are still, as one can obviously tell from that list of uh, occupations very engaged in the actual world. Um, so I want to talk a lot about how you can be as serious as medita- uh, at meditation as, as you are, and yet so fully engaged. Also, you're willing to talk about things that are considered pretty taboo in the medita- meditation world. So I want to talk about that as well. But let me start at the beginning, uh, which is how did you start meditating and why? Yeah, you know, I think I really, um, in Buddhist psychology, there are three types of people, greed, fear, and delusion. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm really a greed type. I just want every possible experience. I want to have the most wild, sensuous experiences, spiritual experiences. And uh, that's actually what got me into it, which is a little unusual. Most people who get into meditation, you know, are experiencing suffering, right? And they want to, like, have less stress. Um, For me, I just wanted to have awesome experiences, which is a really bad reason to get into meditation. (laughs) Sort of a terrible idea. There's Uh, there's a a great quote from your phenomenal book called Evolving Dharma, which I recommend to everybody who's serious about what, what has been called deep end of the pool meditation. You say... When I started out in contemplative practice, I was searching for the mountain on the edge of the world, enlightenment, the big joy, mystical union, the whole spiritual enchilada of love, wisdom, happiness, perfection. And what's interesting to me about that is, and you were starting to talk about this, I was interested because I wanted to be 10% happier. I wanted to be less of a schmuck, you know, uh, to myself and others. I wanted to have my monkey mind toned down just a little bit. I didn't even, uh, enlightenment was not on the, on the, um, uh, uh, in the picture at all. So why did you want this stuff and why did you even believe enlightenment was real? Well, you know, I came at it from, I was an academic before I was a practitioner, right? So, you know, I have this PhD in religion and I was studying mysticism for a lot of my 20s when I wasn't busy going to law school. Uh, So, so that was really, the impetus was reading about some of these experiences. I was just amazed at the, you know, the way that so many people expressed uh, these kinds of transcendent experiences in different ways, but with a lot of commonalities. And uh, but so why I, didn't you think they were full of crap? Why didn't you think they're just making a lot up? of people? Also, these are the people who are like experts at looking at their own mind over you know three thousand years, and they all seem to have these wild experiences, you know, without uh, eating mushrooms or or with eating mushrooms for that matter. But you know, there were all these people who had these sort of transcendent experiences. It just seemed, I don't know, I, I, so I did study it for a while with a really skeptical eye, never intending that this would be something that I did. Uh, but when the opportunity came along, so it, it seemed like something worth trying. Did it work? Did you experience the whole spiritual enchilada? It actually did work. I wouldn't call it the whole enchilada, maybe a taco. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, the way it worked... A flauta. Exactly. Right? <laughs> it's definitely a chalupa, a spiritual chalupa. Uh, my first retreat, you know, I did think, okay, great, here I am, seven days of silence. Uh, it was in a kind of a Jewish context. So there was like Kabbalah around, which is what I'd focused on my 20s. And I thought, all right, great, I'm going to have these experiences. What I didn't know, and maybe what you didn't know, is that, you know, we're just all liars. I mean, actually... Actually, it's really difficult meditation and when you go into the deep end and you, you start looking at, you know, difficult things and you see what a jerk you really are. And then, you know, da, 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 da. I didn't, you know, there's a Buddhist book called Who Ordered This Truckload of Dung, which I think is a great title for a meditation book. You could, maybe that'll be your next book. You yeah. Just call it that. Can I just steal just that? Just call that. Just do that. He's a monk. He can't, can't own anything anyway, the guy who wrote it. So that's how I felt that first week. But then as the mind quiets down, some of those experiences did actually arise. Again, I wouldn't call it necessarily the whole enchilada, but it was a taste of something deeply profound. But what are we talking about? Uh, So I think now when I look back on it, it's, you know, I've deepened those experiences quite a lot since the 
first retreat, tried to get a little more systematic about what's going on and what you know how much is delusion and how much is is what's what's really happening. It does seem as though it's possible with concentration, sort of real, you know focusing the mind and and cutting down on how much noise is there, you can really have a vivid experience of something very you know mundane. So I have a a piece in one book where I talk about a string bean, you know, it was the most profound string bean that I ever, uh, that I ever ate in my life. And it was just an ordinary string bean. So it's not that the, you know, it's not that you see Lucy in the sky with diamonds. You just kind of imagine or just kind of experience the wonder of every moment. And it turns out to be just like Aldous Huxley said, you know, the, you know, quoting William Blake, right? The doors of perception are cleansed and the world appears very different. And I think that just comes from having a concentrated mind. I don't think it's a, it's a supernatural uh, phenomenon. I don't think there's angels and, you know, God and things like that getting involved. But the mind can relate to things in a different way. And we know that because we experience it all the time. If you're in the flow state, for example, or if you're having a peak experience, you know, birth of a child, for example, or some momentous experience, you know, everything can be really crisp and really clear. Uh, and it's possible to have that s a similar experience, if not the same, just uh, sitting and watching your breath. Right. So you're not leaving it to chance. You're actually developing the capacity to have these experiences. And in Evolving Dharma, you talk about how with a concentrated mind, with a mind where discursive thought has come slowed down, watching paint dry can be exciting even if the paint is already dry. Yeah, it was great. I was doing walking meditation at Insight Meditation Society, and you know the way you do it is you Which walk. Which is, I just want to interrupt you. That that is a retreat center in Central Massachusetts, run by Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg. Right. And uh, one of the practices, you walk back and forth in a room over and over again, which I've doesn't sound it. very exciting, yes. but it is. It can actually be profound. When you get to the end, you know, you're meant to just turn around. I got to the end, and I was staring at this paint, and there were all these bubbles, and it was beautiful, and it was beige, and it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And again, you know, no drugs uh, involved, just meditation. But, you know, I think the key part to take away from this part of the conversation is as practice deepens, you realize that these experiences are not the point. You know, it's a little bit kind of a sideshow. Uh, and the real point is transformation that's lasting in the mind, not just states of mind, but stages of mind, uh, that it's possible to become 10% happier or 10% more just or 10% more compassionate. But is it possible to become not just 10% happier, but 100% happy? Is enlightenment real? Yeah, I mean, and so, what does it even mean? Yeah, that, so I think the last question is the most important. What does it mean? It depends who's asking. So for, if I take off my Buddhist hat and put on my Jewish hat, you know, I would say, you know, who's asking? Uh, <laughs> what does enlightenment mean? It means different things in different traditions. It's very clear that in some traditions, enlightenment means a theistic experience, so an experience of God, whatever that is. And, and it is an experience. Uh, and it's an experience that's so profound that it, you know, resonates for the rest of one's life. You know, and I think in the Dharma traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc., uh, it's less about having that particular experience and more about just suffering less, holding on less, grabbing less. And that's just training the mind. And we can see that in our own practice. You know, I think, you know, it's been a couple of years since you wrote 10% happier. Probably now you're 12% happier. Yeah, I'm, you know what? I realize I'm going to be stuck with math jokes the rest of my life. Yeah, well, you know, that was you and your publicist's <laughs> fault. <laughs> so I think it, you just see it in practice that it actually does happen. And then you meet people who seem for more advanced, just like in anything else, you can become, you know, 10% more fit, you know, and then you meet some athlete or, you know, some marathon runner or something like that, who's really, really fit. And those are the examples that inspire us. And so I've come across some of those people. Again, they're not necessarily mystical woo woo uh, people you would immediately spot. They're not wearing necessarily brightly colored robes, but people who really grasp less. And, but 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 the Buddha wasn't advertising, uh, you know, incremental improvement. He was talking about when he talked about enlightenment. Although, as you point out in your book, he didn't use the word enlightenment. When he talked about awakening and liberation, he talked about the remainderless uprooting of greed, hatred, and delusion. That is that's the enchilada that's right the enchilada, there. Yeah. And so, I mean, do you think that is possible? Uh, sure. You know, have you ever I, seen anybody? I, I've seen people who seem to be very unstuck. Uh, and who are in difficult situations, and they react just like human beings do, but they are not, you know, as stuck as I get when I'm in a traffic jam. Um, so, and they're in more such serious situations than that. So, I don't think it, it, it you know, I don't think it's necessarily a all or nothing enchilada or no enchilada approach. And I, and I think, you know, just even in any map, like in the Buddhist map, the Theravadan Buddhist map, there's four stages of enlightenment. In the Tibetan Buddhist map, there are 12 stages of enlightenment. There are all these stages, the Zen ox herding pictures, which is the stages of enlightenment, have stages along the path. So, you know, in a way, yeah, it's the deep end of the pool, but it's a, it's a 
a slope from the shallow end to the deep end. It's not that you just jump right in and you're now at full depth. So it's like you get a flauta and then you get a plate full of flautas. And I then think maybe... this uh, metaphor is getting pretty annoying yeah, by so, now. Yeah, but if it, if uh, you know uh, if we want to keep going, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what you just said. All right, I'll leave it alone. I'll I'll stop <laughs> flogging this ox. Um, so describe to me. So you talked right there about. Uh, the different maps of enlightenment among the different Buddhist traditions. And there are maps, you can correct me if I'm wrong, in the various uh, mystical strains of the Abrahamic faith as, as well. But I think you and I mostly practice Buddhist meditation, and you talked about the Theravadan map, which is where you've spent most of your time. This is Theravada is one of the schools of Buddhism. Um, it's probably the oldest, the old school. Um, so it's called in, in this school the progress or the path of insight. Break it down for us. How does that work? So without going in the sort of nitty gritty and getting lost in the weeds, the, the idea is that in intensive practice, the deep end of the pool, uh, the mind naturally kind of goes through certain certain cycles. Uh, you see this and then you see that and you see the other thing. And again, that shouldn't necessarily be surprising or mystically strange. If you're studying math, first you do with arithmetic and then eventually you'll get to algebra and then eventually you'll get to calculus. Um, so it's kind of similar. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's how the mind sees through certain patterns all the time. So for example, it looks to, it looks to me and you like, you know, there's a table here and it's very solid and it's never going away. Obviously we know intellectually that's not true. You know, hopefully sooner rather than later, an interior designer will come in and realize that this table should be replaced. Um, and then and the table won't be here. So, but it's possible to really kind of intuitively get that. And that I think is the part that I want to emphasize is that, you know, you can just read the path of insight in a book, but it, the, the, it's really more like a cookbook and you don't taste the dish just by reading the recipes. You actually have to do it. So you do it, the mind eventually develops what are understood as intuitive knowledges. Like it gets it, you, know, you really get it. Um, you know, just like a small child at a certain point, they get it, you know, don't run into traffic. Hopefully they get it or they, you know, they understand, they get certain things in a basic intuitive level that doesn't require like a lot of thinking about it. And so the notion is that the mind goes through these various stages of insight uh, when guided through a te with a teacher or just in retreat. And then eventually the mind really begins to let go and it learns to let go. Um, and then sometimes it really lets go entirely and kind of, kind of unplugs. And that's seen as an experience that, that leaves some kind of transformation that doesn't go away. But that letting go entirely and unplugging has a name and it's nirvana. Yeah, it's a it's a, a, a moment of seeing nirvana clearly. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, it's hard to, yeah, I hate to sound mystical and say it's hard to really put it into words. Um, it does also mean different things in different traditions. I think it's just the the mind intuitively learning that it's possible to let go of all the technical term is all formations, which means everything we perceive, every, everything we think, that it's just possible to kind of unplug in a certain way. And it, you know, it's not so radically different from other mind states that we enter every day, like sleep, for example. You know, if you're constantly thinking about trying to go to sleep, you can't fall asleep, but the mind learns how to let go. This is just letting go in a more profound way, in a way that enables the mind to really exhale all the time in a certain way. But so, okay, if I'm letting go uh, of everything, how you, if you, if you or you are letting go of everything, how are you a lawyer, rabbi, meditation teacher, gay rights activist, author, <laughs> columnist for the Daily Beast, how are you so, so active and successful in the world if you've taught yourself to let go? Well, because I'm still uh, a baby at letting go. I'm just not that advanced. You know, at most I'm 25% of the way to the enchilada. So I almost went back into that metaphor with which pieces of the enchilada I have. Um, but, you know, I think there's also a, there's, I think it's a helpful thing to think about the concept of karma, not in some mystical sense, but just in the, the way that we live. So, you know, what are the causes and conditions? You know, my karma being born in the West to, you know, my socioeconomic group and so on. And, you know, so there's some desire to kind of keep doing that kind of work. Um, you know, maybe after I, I get my triple crown and get the uh, the Emmy and the Oscar and the Tony or something that I won't care as much yeah, anymore yeah. right but right now I right now I still uh, I still have that desire uh, to change the world to somehow bring about more compassion and less injustice so those kinds of things are still there but if I, so if I was fully enlightened would I not 
try to achieve anything? So that's like a that's a question which luckily we'll cross that bridge when we get to yeah. it. Uh, and I don't worry about it too much. Yeah. yeah. You know, it also so for example, I'll go to a different tradition in the Hasidic tradition of Judaism, there was a concern that if you're just in the presence of the divine all the time, you won't do anything. So the scholars call this quietism. Right? So quietists, you just there's no reason to do anything. You're just in the purely bathing in the divine radiance all the time. And that does actually come up. There are, there are concerns uh, that the Hasidim have in the 19th century that the mystics might get too enlightened and then they wouldn't do the work of like taking care of their community, for example, um, which they, they had responsibilities to their community and to their families, for that matter. So you do see that, but I, I think it's kind of a, yeah, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Um, so I know you didn't want to get too nitty gritty about the path of insight, but can you get a little uh, nittier and grittier in terms of how many stages are, they? as I understand it, there are four sort of big paths, right? Four stages. And within each four stages, there's something like 16 mini stages. Or? Yeah, 16, 18, depending on how you count it. And uh, these are just what I was saying before, how the mind sort of intuitively learns different things kind of in a sequence. Uh, that's just the sequence. Uh, the first couple are very basic. So for example, one, the, for, I think the first one or the second one is just cause and effect. It's just, okay, I get it. There's cause and effect. Things happen as cause and effect. But there's something really profound, actually, just in that, in the cause and effect piece. So for example, most of the time, like right now, you might be thinking of your next question and you think that you're thinking about that question or I'm thinking about my answer I'm thinking about the answer actually that's not happening right there's just cause and effect so you've had your training you have your curiosity you have your genetic background da -da 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 -da, your agenda whatever those are the things that's actually determining the next question so just seeing cause and effect helps sort of loosen the this delusion that a very helpful delusion uh, that there's a, there's a self driving the car the car is a self driving car uh, the self emerges as a phenomenon in consciousness and most I think neuroscientists would sort of agree you won't find a homunculus in the brain somewhere like where the self actually is it's more of an emergent property of the brain. Buddha didn't have any of those concepts, of course. Um, but you just see in cause and effect. So that, you know, you know, this is cause and effect, not self. This is cause and effect, not self. When I get hungry, I get hangry. Now I'm angry. Is it that I'm angry? Well, the causes for anger are present. I got hungry. Now I'm angry. It's just that very simple thing, but you see it over and over and over again. So that's an example of one of the insight knowledges, one of the very early ones, the insight into cause and effect. But you, so you raise there a big issue, uh, and I know I'm trying to get you to talk about the progress of insight, and, and I'm going to derail us just for a second because you brought up one of the hardest things to understand about Buddhism or meditation practice, and I, it's also there in um, other in other traditions as well, which is that the self is an illusion. Uh, I I get it intellectually, I think, but it's hard to get viscerally. So just talk a little bit more about. Because I think most of us believe that we're very real. We look in the mirror, and there we are. Yeah, sure. Our body is there, right? So there's one of the other insight knowledges is the difference between mind and body. Um, but just, you know, I want to grab that a phrase that you just said, like you get it intellectually but not viscerally. That's the whole that's, – that's the point, right, is that it's one thing to sort of have somebody say something and you read it and if you agree or disagree. It's another thing – you know, my word for viscerally is you get it in your kishkas, right, in your, mm -hmm. in your guts. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's really there and you're like, oh, yeah, that. Yeah, okay. And you just sort of see it. Um, that's the point of practice, right? To move from one kind of knowledge to another. Um, but it doesn't have to be, mis again, mystical or profound. You know, I, I, in a previous book about non-duality, in the sense that there's no difference between subject and object, um, I had sort of the instruction of just, you know, imagine raising your hand. So you, you could decide, somebody listening or, or watching this podcast right now, you know, if I say, well, go ahead and raise your hand, and they'll either do it or they won't. So let's say you do it. And then you could review what were all the factors that led to you raising the hand. All right, so I said something, but obviously wouldn't do anything I said. So maybe some curiosity or an assessment of the risk seems like a, a low risk activity. I'll give it a shot. Uh, obviously, all the physical processes that were there, da, 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 da. you can make a list of 100, 200, 300 factors that caused that action to happen. And none of them will be Dan. Like there's no there's no one that's right there that is actually, well, that was me. I decided it. Well, all, all these different factors of, and different things about you, your personality. You know, maybe you uh, had an o overbearing father who told you what to do all the time. And so when some schmo on a podcast says to raise your hand, you're like, no way, I'm not doing that. Okay, so there's that cause, right? Cause and effect, not self. Cause and effect, not self. It's not, there's not the, there's no there there. Um, and if you look for, you know, there's a part of the brain, the, the PCC, which uh, Judd Brewer, I'm sure will be a guest of yours at some point, mm -hmm. uh, studies, which kind of does the act of selfing. 
right? Having that perception of the self, which is very helpful because it helps you not get run over when you cross the street. All of my examples are about crossing the street because <laughs> I live in New York. Um, it's either that or meditating on the subway. Or Mexican food. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I see we're seeing a pattern here. Um, and so, you know, but that's, so that selfing process is really happen is really helpful, but it's a, it's a process. It's not a reality. It's just how we, how we see things. Soon yeah. we'll all be gone. Right? But, but, but I, I have had this debate with my mom, uh, who well, that always works. Who, I, it hasn't worked. I have, I've never won this debate, any debate. You know what Ram Dass said? If you think you're enlightenment, go spend some time with your parents. <laughs> My mom does not drive me crazy. What she does is make me realize how foolish some of my conclusions are sometimes or how hasty I've been. I said, my mom is a scientist, very rigorous mind, um, and she's gotten interested in Buddhism as a consequence of my interest. And she's on me about this idea of no self or selflessness or emptiness. Um, <clears throat> one of the things she says is just because you can't find it doesn't mean it isn't there. Yeah, well, people have been looking for 2,500 years, so that does suggest a certain difficulty in finding it. It's not like I just spent Sunday afternoon and was like, yeah, <laughs> can't really can't really find the self, so I guess there is none. Uh, so that's one data point, I suppose. But it, it's also, you can all just let go of the concept if it's not helpful. But I think for me, it is helpful because uh, where there's no self, there's also that part that's that suffering isn't really running the show. You know, the part of the the part of the ego that wants to run the show is the least competent part of our mm. minds to run mm -hmm. the show. And yet it's convinced that it, it you know, is going to take care of things. It's convinced that you're doing well or doing not well. And it has all of the answers. And it's there, you know, it's a nice function of the mind trying to keep you safe, trying to make you happy in a certain way. Uh, it just doesn't work. There was another Hasidic rabbi in, in the 1960s named uh, Mick Jagger who pointed <laughs> out that you can't always get what you want. And so that little voice that says, I will only be happy if I get what I want is 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 not, it's evolutionarily adaptive, right? If we didn't have that, you know, our great ancestors who didn't do that, they probably didn't reproduce enough, right? They, they got eaten by a tiger or something. But now that voice just causes suffering. Not, well, I mean, it doesn't just cause, I mean, sometimes it gives you good ideas, right? Sure. No, that's right. Yeah. I'll take out the word just. Uh, it can cause you a lot of it suffering. It can cause a whole lot of suffering. I mean, the beauty... At least it does for me. Yeah, you know, for go sure. Go see it for yourself. But for me, that it does. And, and, no uh, question. So it would be no nice question. to not take it quite as seriously. Yes. So back to the, the path of insight. One of the little stages along the path is... Do you need to drink water? You no, no, okay. no, no, no. Um, one of the stages along the path... Cause and effect, not so. <laughs> okay. One of the stages is called dark night. Or actually, it's called fear, I think, in the traditional language, but um, uh, now it's often referred to as the dark night. Basically, you freak out. Um, describe why you freak out and how big a deal dark night is. And I, you've gone through it, so how bad is it? Yeah, so I would say two things. First of all, there's regular freaking out, and then there's this kind of freaking out. People freak out all the time. Uh, you can freak out when you get the wrong appetizer at, at uh, you know at the diner. It doesn't mean that you are going through the dark night of the soul, or what they're really called are the dukkhanyanas, the, the stages of insight that are suffering, uh, which doesn't sound very appealing. I, I didn't actually see that on the uh, on the mindfulness based stress reduction website. <laughs> the ten percent app, uh, ten percent happier app, will take you through the stages that bring suffering. <laughs> Great, sign me up. Uh, so there's also just ordinary freakouts, and I, and I'm one. I tend to be a little skeptical of the over reliance on maps. So I think maps are really helpful, but uh, I don't know. Who knows what any particular person, what experience they're having at any particular time. So that's the first thing I just want to say. Sometimes you just freak out. Um, so this kind of freak out tends to happen after a big peak experience, which is known as the knowledge of the arising and passing away. Another stage. In that's one progress. of the, that's yeah. stage uh, three or four on the, on the 18. Mm -hmm. So you're going along, you're going along, and then you somehow just kind of get it. And, you know, I think a lot of people have had that. I certainly had that experience many, many times where – it's hard to really put into words because, again, we understand that things are arising and passing away, but you somehow get it intuitively in this profound sense. And it can be really awesome. People think they're, people think they're super enlightened at that point. They, you know, they've had this like big, big, big experience. You know, there was a, another best-selling book about spirituality that had three, title, three words in the title that I won't name, uh, where somebody has this huge experience, and it's awesome, and they're really happy for having that experience. Well, you can name all and that's, eat, pray, love. And that's yes, great. Like, yeah. that's a wonderful experience. But, you know, that's like, okay, that's like an arising and passing away experience. Like, that's part of the path. It comes along. It's a thing. And then, like Jack Kornfield said, you know, after the ecstasy, the laundry. So, like, you've had this, like, awesome experience. You thought, like, maybe you're some sort of super enlightened, awakened being. And then, actually, you know, the stuff hits the fan. You're not actually that awake. And so, naturally, uh, you know, after the light, the shadow, you kind of fall into these, these realizations 
you know, arising and passing away sounds kind of cool, maybe in some Yoda mystical sense, but you really start, it's hard to hold on to things like, you know, perceptions are just rising and passing and you get a little dissociative and you, you get a little, it's, it's a tough time. And that's why I think the people who take this path seriously um, are concerned uh, that people should have a, a good teacher. All you really need to get through it is a good teacher and some resilience on your own. Uh, somebody who's guiding you and is like, oh, don't worry, you're not having a nervous breakdown, you're not dissociating, you're not having like a borderline personality disorder. Here's this text from 2,000 years ago which describes exactly what's happening to you. You know, I wouldn't say don't worry because you're, you're worrying, that's part of what's happening, but don't worry, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be all right, just keep doing the thing, keep going along. You know, sometimes when people don't have that kind of guidance, uh, they can get into real trouble. And so I think there's not, it's not something to be afraid of. It's just something that any competent teacher in any tradition will know is this is the kind of thing that comes up. So you talk about this a lot in, in Evolving Dharma, but I, the, the, the practice of meditation is currently advertised in part by people like me is this whole idea of you can be 10% happier, or as John Kabat-Zinn says, you can be, it, we, we can, you can be less stressed through mindfulness-based stress reduction. But what you're talking about here is that the, this practice, as originally intended, that less stress and marginal Im improvements in happiness are actually side effects. The real thing is going to take you through some, some pretty tough territory. So do we need to think about how we're, do I need to be thinking about as, a, as an evangelist for meditation do, and a guy who has a meditation app, do I need to be thinking about how there can be some really tough stages of the practice? Or does that only really happen when, when people do what you've done, which is go away and do months of silent meditation? In my experience, is it really only comes in intensive practice. Others might disagree, but um, my personal experience, the experience of my, te my, my students, you know, I'm a meditation teacher now, among other things. I lead week-long silent retreats. You don't usually get into this really deep stuff, even in a week of silence, let alone if you're meditating 20 minutes a day to feel a little bit less stressed. So I, I'm not actually worried about it. I think um, mindfulness, second Secular mindfulness is a great gateway drug for those those who are interested in taking a, a deeper trip, but that's only some percentage of people. You know, I think um, you know your work and the work of other people who do the kinds of stuff you do. That that's alleviating suffering for millions and millions of people, right? Who are trying to they're not trying to get big enlightenment or awakening or liberation. They're trying to be happier and they're trying to be to be less angry with their spouse or uh, you know, more effective with their workmates and stuff. That's not that's true. That's not what the original teachings of the Buddha in, in India, you know, 2500 years ago were about. But it's an adaptation of them uh, to contemporary times. And I don't think in that adaptation, you know, you lose a lot. But one of the things that you lose is some of this hard stuff. So it's a good thing to lose. Uh, and, you know, I think you can get to a, an incrementally better adjusted, less stressed out place as, you know, insert scientific studies here without inviting in some of these deep, profound states. I don't think you also won't get to like some pow powerful and permanent transformation of the mind. Uh, but again, I don't think that's the goal. So back to the progress of insight. First of all, you made me feel better there, so thank you. Back to the progress of insight. It's just me being a skillful teacher. I was actually just totally lying. Yeah. I don't <laughs> you know. are a skillful you're like teacher. Giving, you're like giving the keys to a drunk driver, and, and they're, they're all going to crash. I, uh, that's not true, just that's for anybody true, who yeah. takes J2 seriously. And I'm a lawyer, so I can expressly <laughs> disclaim any liability on behalf of uh, my host. Uh, I should say, by the way, that not only um, am I interested in you because I read your book, but we've been friends for a couple of years, and and so that that is part of why this. I assume every guest you have uh, jokes about enchiladas. No, no, no you're no, special in true. that regard. Um, I saw that talk with the Dalai Lama. Wasn't he? He was talking about enchiladas. Mexican food did not come up in it that didn't. conversation. He did make fun of me, um, like you do. Um, anyway, you will not you will not um, get me off my path here. The, uh, back to the <laughs> the path of insight. Um, so after these eighteen stages. Uh, there is a an experience, a cessation experience that you were talking about before, an experience of nirvana. This is people are for some reason, which I hope you will explain. It this is considered taboo to discuss. You can discuss it in theory, but you're not supposed to discuss your own experiences of it. Uh, you, however, in your book, you talk about it. Why did you do that, and what was it like to have this experience of uh, of Nirvana, which is such a loaded term? It's a band from 1991, and um, also just like a kind of a word we use mostly flippantly um, 
So anyway, I'll stop talking and let you talk. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes when we use the nirvana, use the word nirvana, we're like, oh, that must be like the best orgasm ever, yeah. like the most incredible. Yeah. And that's not, you know, it's just it's just the state of letting go. I mean, that's a lot less interesting than the greatest orgasm ever. It's just, it's 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 what the world looks like when the mind isn't clinging to it, when it's not holding on. Um, so you know, it's just me. It literally kind of means like going out extinguishing like extinguishing that pattern where where everything i want i really want it's fine to want things but that's not you know we really want them like i gotta have it it's that gap between perception and craving so you like you can have the desire but then not stick on to it right and that little gap uh, according again this is in the the buddhist uh, scriptures that's that's where that's where liberation can happen and i think liberation is more helpful than enlightenment enlightenment suggests that like you get something liberation just means you kind of get off of something mm. you get off the hamster wheel non-addiction like when they right yeah that's an yeah i'm sure that's is that a uh, mark uh, joseph goldstein joseph. Yeah. i, so, I don't you have know, any original if you imagine, thank you for if pointing you, that out if you, counselor <laughs> if you imagine that you're you know a hamster on the wheel like what's the state of the hamster not on the wheel i mean it's still just a hamster right it's just not on the wheel right it might even go on the wheel once in a while for fun but not because it thinks that that's the way to get ahead. So that's I, I like to sort of demystify it. That's one reason I talk about it. It's also the first of these four stages is, is pretty accessible. Any, anybody can do it with enough practice. Um, all of the leading teachers in this particular tradition, the Theravadan tradition, have gone through that. The leading teachers in Zen and Tibetan traditions, have they have equivalents that they've all... So you, anytime you meet sort of a Zen teacher who's set up in a lineage and is teaching they've reached at least this level of uh, liberation. Do they call it Kensho or, or whatever or, the experience yeah. is, whatever the, you know, and it's, they're, they're different maps, not everything aligns, but whatever, they've had these kinds of experiences. So it's not as though, you know, the, the Buddha didn't say this is only accessible to, you know, the rarefied few. Um, actually, the Buddha said it's accessible to everybody. Yes, he did. So that seems like, that, that seems like an interesting pragmatic approach uh, to this kind of meditation practice on the, again, on the, in the deep end uh, of the pool, as you, to use that metaphor. Um, so that's why I talk about it. And again, it's not, I don't think that I'm claiming anything that every other teacher hasn't experienced and they have. You know, there are two reasons. There's, there are two reasons why it's not, why it is taboo. I mean, the first is an old one. The second is a new one. Um, you know, there's an idea that certainly a fully enlightened being doesn't go around saying, I'm a fully enlightened being. Except for the Buddha. Right. So he I, did. He was calling himself the yeah. Tathagata, right? right? So, I mean, you know, the one who's always gone beyond. There's always an exception. Right. Uh, no, there, there, are, there are many people in the Pali Canon in those original texts uh, who are described as Arhan. They've fully, they're fully enlightened. Uh, later, eventually, the idea came along that you know the true arhat shouldn't say so. Um, An arhat just so people know person. is a fully enlightened being. Yeah. So, uh, and that got extended even to these lower, more mundane. Uh, levels that that i've gotten to and many other people have gotten to and then second in the contemporary sphere you could just imagine um how well this whole stages of enlightenment thing went over with a bunch of competitive americans going over in the 1960s and 70s right so you know we have uh you know, presidential candidates who want to compare their anatomies so like that's mm. just sort of a thing that americans like to do well, well i've gotten to stage 17.3 and you've only gotten to stage 17.1 and you know who's got what attainment and who got to this and who did that and you know so early on in the year in the founding of the Western uh, traditions that uh, you know that drew on these older ones, there was sort of this sense of you know let's just let's tone down all the competitive stuff and uh, let's not talk about all of this stuff. And I think that was wise. Uh, maybe went too far to the other side about making it mystifying and weird and who knows what this is. But I think that's that's why it happened. How do you know? That you didn't delude yourself into thinking you had this experience because you know you had you knew about the maps um, and so you were kind of primed to to want to go in this direction. So how do you know it really happened? Well, so the funny thing is, is that for three weeks after having what this experience seems to have been, by the way, it's I called stream I, entry, right. right? That's the technical so, term. That's right. So because you just and it just means you've entered the stream of the Dharma. It's not like a big deal like okay so now you're now you're in you're in the gang you've had your initiation experience right um you say it's just a few steps beyond being a novice yeah no i, I mean yeah, it's like two or three months down out from being a novice you know you could you could unplug and and you'll get it in a month or maybe two months if you're a slow learner and uh so, so give me three that's yeah you take take 90 days just you know so <laughs> within six months i think you would be able to uh so that's um you know that's that's the 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 basic idea is that you're just kind of getting into the getting into the stream so to speak um but why are you convinced it was real all oh, right so uh 
Right. So after I had the, the sort of experience, I was sure that wasn't it because I'd read some book which said it was supposed to be something else. So actually, but I was walking around feeling sublimely happy for some unknown reason. I was like, well, I know that wasn't stream entry, but it sure did change my life. That was really awesome. That was incredible. Da, 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 da. But because I had some preconceived notion, even after having the experience, I, you know, I just assumed, well, I don't know. I read this book that this should happen and that should happen and those things didn't happen. Therefore, that wasn't it. Um, you know, I was working with a teacher. I was in Nepal uh, in the middle of a five month silent meditation jag and uh he was very skilled in these maps in these particular in this particular tradition which again i'll just say is one of many many it's not like this is the map uh but he was on on this set of maps and you know he had me really review the experience carefully and was there a kind of a gap in your series of perceptions and how did that work and could you re could you uh make it happen again if you sort of like a scientific method so it was pretty rigorous uh kind of going through all that stuff but then, you know, the real proof is in the pudding. I mean, it was one of those kind of before and after experiences. And again, I've had like awesome spiritual experiences now for 20 odd years. So it's not like I'm not familiar with the idea of, you know, having an awesome experience. This was this did seem really qualitatively different. And it's just very accessible. You know, one of my favorite practices on in daily life is just to kind of touch back to that place of non-seeking, non-desiring mind. It's always accessible. It's right there just got into it now isn't that great it's worth it you just did it right now yeah sure and yet you are i mean i know you you are a really ambitious guy and and so how do these two things work together i mean there's two there's two answers the truth and then the sort of mystical bs that i'll give you okay so the truth You're is tell me which is which yeah okay. the truth is that uh again i'm just early on on the path and i'm still fully captive by the same forces of greed hatred and delusion as everyone else even if i'm 25 percent of the way there that means i'm 75 percent not there mm. so that's the truth uh the mystical bs line that i could give you is you know you can be in the world but not be totally of the world right you can sort of want something but not feel as though your life is a mess if you don't get it mm. um and so it's possible to kind of see through uh, these phenomena which and, and still love everything about them, love great experiences, be really upset about injustice and want to work toward, you know, and, and violence and all of those kinds of things. And so um, I'm calling it mystical BS because that's actually the truth, but I want to sort of hide it in the language of mystical BS so you don't think that I'm really arrogant. <laughs> I don't. I know you also well enough to know that you're not really arrogant. And here I'm going to ask a question that proves that, which is you wrote another book, uh, which I was able to read parts of, but not the whole thing. It's called the, the Gate of Tears. And it's beautifully written. And one of the things it's actually it's all about the fact that even even though you've had these amazing experiences, life is hard. And you lost your mother. I met your mother. She's a wonderful, wonderful human being. And it was very painful for you, justifiably. And just because you're a stream enterer didn't make it not suck uncontrollably. So talk a little bit about that. It's, it seems like you can get pretty far in meditation, but it, it doesn't end pain and suffering. And I don't think we would want it to, though, right? That's part of what's in the Gate of Tears. Like, I don't think we'd want to have this existence in which we don't feel pain at the loss of our parent. I mean, right? I wouldn't want to live that way. That's what I meant before when I was talking about karma. Like, maybe it would be better to just not be affected by anything but it's not it's not an aspiration of mine and i and I, you know i don't know i don't really know people who are like that who are just totally colorless and and bland it's those aren't my role models um my role models are people who really are engaged in the world and in relationships with with others with their family members so yeah i mean the gate of tears really actually is about embracing that full range of human experience as part of what it is to be alive and it's possible to and this is a little hard to communicate for non-meditators but even in, in just in the beginning of mindfulness we can see that it's possible to coexist with difficult feelings without being taken over by them so people would ask me you know shortly after my mom died uh you know, how are you doing? And I'd say, I'm doing really badly. That's fine, right? And it's That's like, fine. Yeah, it Interesting. Is, and it was fine. First of all, it felt good to feel bad because it was it was coming from love. But what am I supposed to be feeling, right? Yeah, it, it feels terrible. Like, it was really rough. And that's fine. That's what it that's what it should be. And and it's possible again to have just a slightly different relationship as if we're settling settled back a little bit, or as if there's you know, one metaphor is like you can be the sky instead of the storm and just sort of be present with all these things that happen, the joys, the sorrows, everything else, in a way that actually makes them quite profound. It just makes it like another season of the year, really beautiful in its own way, and a, a way that we can relate to one another if we're able to be authentic with one another and emotionally authentic. And that, to me, is the other enchilada. That's really the, the part about being in authentic relationship 
uh, both with people I know and with people I don't know. A lot of my politics comes from an attempt to be empathetic toward the other and not say the others are, you know, the rapists and murderers or the others are the threat that we can't do anything about. That there's something, I think, really profound about not falling into this, the, that othering capacity that we all have. The you may have just answered the question, but I was going to ask you before, what is the difference in your life pre and post stream entry? And, and it, did you just answer it or, or are there other things to say? Um, I would say the main thing is to ask my friends. Um, and since you can't do that, I'll just I mean, people who knew me before and after, it's just a whole different thing, you know, and, and just the level of. So, you know. I think all of us who are involved in fields where we're trying to compete and get ahead, you know, there's that voice that says you, you suck and you're inadequate and mm. you know, whatever. So that voice comes along. And it's like, oh, there's that voice. Well, that's a stupid voice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, and it's not even stupid as too much like pushing it away. It's like, okay, there's that voice that was installed early by my well-meaning <laughs> Jewish parents who gave me, you know, gave me love when I got a hundred and, and asked me what I got wrong when I got a 98, right? Okay. So that's like installed, like, probably not getting out for you know for the rest of my life but it doesn't mean i like really believe it um so that's just one example i i really did believe it a lot beforehand it's it's really it was before and after transformation it's coincidentally too i came back i was on that retreat during the financial crisis in 2008 2009 and i, I sort of came back as and the world had lost its mind yeah. and it was really interesting because i thought i was pretty weird i grew a long beard and i was hanging out with monks and like who's you know I, pretty much a weirdo right and then i came back and the whole world was the weirdo world and it actually really reinforced the the idea that there were really different there are different lines and axes of truth and um i'm just i'm still a greed type i just want all of them <laughs> i'm i'm keeping an eye on the clock because i know you've got to run soon but we've got 10 minutes i could honestly take another two hours and 10 minutes but i'm book at any of the podcast listeners you, uh, probably not yes we, i think people <laughs> what i think podcasts are actually a sign that all is not lost in, in, in modern society because here you have these totally gleefully nerdy discussions of deep dive into whatever you want and people are consuming them in large numbers. I think it's phenomenal, but that's a complete digression. Uh, let me get back to the point, which is when you describe stream entry and I sit here with, even though I have no idea whether it's real, but I sit here with somebody I like and trust and respect and you're describing this experience, and so I'm inclined to believe you're not um, lying to me or deluded. And so I want it. But how do I get it with, I got a kid, I got a full-time job, I, I write books, I host a game show, I... Um, I give speeches. Um, well, let go uh, of the game show. That's the step one. Well, that only takes like a week. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the long way of saying I have a lot of things to do, how could I possibly a a attain what you have? Yeah, I mean, look, the truth is, I mean, this is not this is not the popular answer, but the truth is those, these were monastic practices. They were for monks and nuns. And it's you, you can't actually have it all. And it may just be that your karma with your, again, your causes and conditions with your family, your job, your profession, maybe not. Um, I do. There are teachers who say that you can get to these levels uh, in daily life with a certain kind of intensive practice. Um, I didn't do that. Uh, for me, it was easier to unplug uh, and go away for a while. But um, there are people who say you can do it. But, you know, I think, but look, I mean, your point about, you know, you're saying this thing and you seem reasonable you know, you can replicate that a hundred times. I mean, Joseph Goldstein's gotten way more than first of these four paths. Again, he's you know, my meditation. He teacher. may not, yep. he may not say how many he's gotten, but it's definitely more than he, one. He says between one and three. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it, you know, that's, there are a lot of people who seem pretty reasonable and yet who have these kinds, who have had these uh, transformations. And again, I want to yeah, get away from I can't from tell the, if it's like uh, the real deal or like some elaborate affinity scam that I'm, I'm like falling into. Well, it depends how, how much of a check you wrote to them. I don't know, you know, how much you donated to that uh, that Ponzi scheme up there in Massachusetts. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so I think that's that's key, right? That's why if you if you look actually again, let's flash back to some of the, the scriptures from 2,500 years ago. You know, the fa what are the factors that lead to a Awakening, one of the ones that appears over and over and over again is called noble friends and acquaintances. So that, noble friends, sorry, noble friends and conversations. So having, and what they mean by noble uh, isn't like knights and dukes, but people who have, who have done practice, who you can, you know, relate to and having conversations with them and finding out what it's like for them in, in uh, lived experience. But no, I, I think it is possible. Look, it's not always possible to unplug for a month, but sometimes it is. I was very fortunate in 2008, it's 2007, I ended a relationship. I was at a, a nice job transition point. 
I was very fortunate uh, at that point that I could really decide this is really something I want to try to do. And uh, I was fortunate that the right books and stuff came along and I'd heard about these paths in practice. And, um, and so I went for it. And at some point, the circumstances align. Uh, or maybe it's true. Maybe it can be attained in daily life, but with very intensive practice. Again, for me, that's not my path. It's it's just I'm too entranced by all the stuff that keeps us busy all the time uh, to uh, to really devote to practice while I'm in the world. So, Well, what I've tried to do, and I don't know if this will be enough, and obviously everybody's kind of mental situation is different. Uh, the, the Buddhist term would be everybody's paramis are different. But So I have committed to doing two hours a day of, of practice. and, to, oh, and That's a lot more than I do, by the way, just so you, you should know. Which well, is great. The, yeah, you, it's, you go, it's, girl. It's that's what I'm trying it's to hard. say. Um, it's a huge commitment. It's a I, huge know, commitment. I have no idea how you do it. It's It's been hard. Um, also, the, this whole thing about having good friends and, and good in a very specific way. Uh, I've worked very hard to cultivate that. I've, com- I've committed with my wife's permission and, and, and uh, uh, collusion to, to go on at least one long retreat a year. And so I'm trying to do the best I can to create the conditions that would allow these experiences to arise. I don't know if it'll happen, but that's that's what I'm doing. It's also setting intention, too, and having that right intention is, is uh, again, part of, the, that's part of the path, having just set the intention, even that. Uh, is again, it's it's one eighth of the work right there. Uh, And so having that intention to cultivate those things. And again, you know, I think the challenge for people like you and me who tend to be a little ambitious and in the world is ultimately at the end of the day, you really have to, it's, it's, it's almost cruel. You just totally have to get let go of it. And you can't fake it either. You can't sit there and be like, I have let go of the desire for liberation. I don't really care. I don't really care because you're full of it, right? It's not true if you if you still do. So it was, I, I literally, at some point on that retreat in Nepal, just got to the point where I truly didn't care. You know, and I was just like, well, okay, whatever, whatever. And it's so boring, you know, sitting there for hours. I was doing three-hour sits, right? Because when you're on retreat, you get really concentrated. You can sit for a long time. It's not painful. And, um, so, you know, it's just that's a lot of time. You know, like four, three hour sits a day. It's just like a lot of time. That's intensive practice, right? That's really devoting. You know, you think about what it takes to become like a really good musician or a really good athlete or something like that. I can't imagine, you know, I read about these athletes who are, you know, they're training 10 hours a day or whatever. It's just mind boggling. So this is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And to get to that level, that's what it it does seem to require. Maybe, maybe not, but in my experience, it does. Um, Until you actually really are no longer needing it and then it shows up it's really quite perverse it is perverse so the one of the things you talk about that you really document very well in in uh, evolving dharma is you talked about how there is this justified uh, taboo i guess in among the sort of current hierarchy of meditation teachers in this country um against talking about the map against talk uh, about you know a taboo against you know saying where you are um, and, and where your students are and all that stuff on, on the path of insight. But in reaction to that, there has grown up this, this school, and you're actually kind of part of it, of pragmatic or hardcore meditators or Dharma practitioners. So just tell me a little bit about the, who, who, are these, who are these people and what do you think about them? Well, it's like five guys in a room. I mean, it's not a lot of people, right? So first of all, most people do not care. And like, I think it's always good to keep a reality check, right? So like, most people don't care, but the overwhelming people, majority of people don't care about meditation. And the overwhelming people who care about meditation are doing stress reduction and other things which help them lead more productive and more happy lives. So we're already, the people who are like, or the entire universe we're talking to is like a very small group. And then now you've just identified the even smaller <laughs> micro reactant to the <laughs> micro small group. So we're talking like a few folks on a bulletin board, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. now I think there are, there's really interesting things happening in that community uh, and a re-embrace of some of these maps. And uh, so, you know, that there are people who have who really practice in this way, in a very sort of strict way. The person who I went to study with uh, was actually not part of that movement as a traditional monk. Uh, you know, he was German born, but had lived in Burma for, for 30 odd years. Um, and I just felt for me, I'd li- I had that I liked the sense of rootedness that came from really going to a traditional source. It just felt really it felt really good to me. It felt really grounded and not you know, kind of wavy and in the air. Um, but wavy in the air can be fun too. And they're, they're now online communities that are doing really interesting work and kind of charting where people are going. Um, 
of course, in any small, small, small group, then with this person versus that person, and it gets, you know, even though everybody's enlightened, they're still uh, biting each other's heads off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that comes with the territory, it seems. But it is interesting that there is kind of this group of meditation hobbyists uh, who, have, who are geeking out about meditation the same way you might geek out about Game of Thrones and getting really into it and, um, and making progress. I mean, I think Game of Thrones also makes you a wiser person, but this really does. Uh, and and that's, that's what's really powerful about it. Final question. And seriously, I really could talk to you for a long, long time, but final question. Do you, you, you raise the possibility in your book, and again, I just want to emphasize here that, you, for, for, especially for people who are listening, that you are you are not some wild-eyed guru. You are a guy in a blazer who is a, a lawyer, um, also a, a, a columnist. And so you, you make this claim. I want to say that before I talk about the claim that you've made, which is that you think it's possible that maybe the Dharma, Buddhism, could save the world. How could you say that, and what do you mean by it? Why do you believe that? Yeah, so... You know, again, I, I, we're in a political moment in our, in our country where the, like the you don't have to be a, a some sort of Buddhist sage to see the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion really active among lots and lots and lots of people. And so I don't think it's like a radical, weird thing to say, huh, what would it look like if we actually, you know, if people actually worked on those parts of ourselves like this is just part of who we are as human beings it's not it's not like some weird phenomenon you know in this part of the 21st century greed, greed hatred and delusion is part of what it is not even to just be a human even a lot of animals right so this is just part of who we are and it, it does seem to me that um one of the things that could lead to a, a kind of safer and less uh destructive world would be working on my or working on our internal stuff and then replicating that on a macro level and I, that's one reason i'm a big fan of of popular mindfulness right i mean just to like go to a single store and have a desire to buy something and then feel like oh i don't need to listen to that desire okay there's that desire oh yeah that okay i know it on to the next thing just that multiplied by however many people do it is it could have a profound impact, let alone, wow, I, you know, I read about this story and there's crime and I feel really afraid and I have a, dis you know, wh what am I, what do I do with that fear? Oh, I'm not afraid. I'm going to be really strong and I'm going to, you know, I want a really strong leader who's going to take care of the bad guys for me. Or I could say, wow, I must, I might be really afraid. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Maybe I won't listen to that either. It's just those, that difference, I think, actually, again, multiplied by the 5 billion people in the world, um, I think makes a, makes a real impact. And I don't think it's the Dharma in the narrow sense. I don't think everybody's going to become Buddhist, and I don't think, you know, not at all. Um, but I do think that um, as we see, as more and more people can just personally feel the benefits of some kind of contemplative practice. It could be a prayer practice in their church, or if they're spiritual but not religious, it could be a, just a, it could be a yoga practice, whatever it is. As more and more people, I think, just feel that, well, this, this kind of works for me, and here's why, and I can articulate why, and I'm not signing up for something stupid or something you know, that, that requires me to sacrifice my intellectual credibility. Just if that, if that actually keeps happening, that could have a real impact. And I, and I think it is kind of the ultimate think globally, act locally uh, approach. And it doesn't mean, you know, I'm out there every day working on top down, you know, law stuff, religion stuff for my writing and my other work. So it's not like that. It's not like it's either or. But um, ultimately, there's something about human nature that can be uh, evolved uh, and made more wise and compassionate. It's, yeah, it's very gratifying after three years of having occasional lunches with you and reading your books to see my friends sit here and, and deal with my pain in the butt questions and, and give such clear, cogent, and compelling answers. It gives me a lot of naches, as you would say, in the <laughs> Jewish tradition. So bravo. Thank you very much. Well, I'm experiencing a lot of mudita, sympathetic joy, as we would say in the Buddhist tradition for you. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. And, and some envy also. <laughs> <laughs> that we'll discuss next time on the 10% Happier Podcast because we're going to have you back for sure. My pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it.